This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. Solvers, welcome to season three, episode 14 of Resolved Mysteries. If you're new, this is the show where we rewatch, recap, and give you the latest updates to cases featured on the show Unsolved Mysteries. And I'm Eliza. I'm Allison. And I'm Carlin. And thank you for joining us. The next two episodes are ones that I really enjoyed watching. So we record two at a time, so I'm thinking of episode 14 and 15, and mm-hmm. so we've got some good things coming up. Yeah. Uh, many of you know this, but for every review we receive, we donate a dollar to a different organization, and this month's is Big Bones Canine Rescue. So if you want to help us and also help them out, uh, leave us a review on iTunes and or Apple Podcasts, I guess, and it really helps us out. We also have a Patreon, and you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash Resolve Mysteries Podcast. And we have some patrons to shout out who have recently subscribed. So, Carlin, do you want to shout them out? Shout out to Paula M., Vilma T., Stephanie D., Tom, Lauren S., Bree K., Meredith P., Shyla F., Lillian D., Joe N., Casey T., Morgan O., Martha F., and Jessica E. Thank Thank you, guys. If you would also like to support us, and we'll definitely shout your name out on a show, you can, like I said, go to patreon.com slash resolved mysteries podcast. You'll get access to two additional episodes a month and early access to our listener short stacks where you write us letters and we read them or give you updates to cases. Um, and along with goodies in the mail. So go ahead and join if you feel so inclined. And thank you to everyone that has supported us there. Before we get started, we had a message from a listener. Uh, She wrote to us about something that we were discussing in our last listener short stack. So we were talking about the murderer, Dennis Michael Salerno, and the blog he seems to manage from prison. We were wondering why some prisoners have access to internet while others do not. So our amazing listener, Betsy, messaged us on Facebook, and she had this to say. She says, hey there, my favorite Resolved Mysteries gals. I was just listening to the listener short stack, and you guys were asking about how is it there are prisoners that have access to the internet, but only some do and some don't. And the truth is, in my experience, in California, no prisoners have access to the internet at all, ever. However, to get on a dating website... The way it is done is you have to pay a fee, and then you mail in your photos and bio, and the folks who run the site add you. I would imagine it would be similar with blogs and websites. You can also have your family or your friends on the outside run or manage your page or blog. And I went back and I listened to our segment about David Berkowitz and that Christian group yeah. runs his blog, right? if you remember. But it um, seems like he's running it because so much of it is in first person. Like, oh, yeah. It's literally, literally written in his voice. Writing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so she goes on to say, again, this is California, which is the only experience I have, but I do think it's very similar across the board. The one thing that is just a little bit different is a federal prison where I do think they're able to use email in some capacity. I don't quite understand that because I've never been inside one of those prisons or really been close to somebody who's done time there. Prison here, and she says, uh, and I believe she means California, is so cut off from the outside world and technology. It makes it really interesting because while I was away in 2007 until 2010, the things that changed on the outside that I didn't experience for three years were Facebook came out and became popular, smartphones were invented, and the first iPhone came out. Wow. And I think that was most of the big stuff. Wow. So that's a is, lot of advancement. Literally changed our entire world. Exactly. Yep. Like what, 
I read articles with interviews with people who were formerly un- incarcerated for, you know, 25 years or 10 years, and they talk about the changes. But imagine being incarcerated for that small window of time. President Obama was elected. I mean, there's these huge things. So, Betsy, thank you so much for educating us and telling us your story. Uh, it was great to hear from you. We appreciate yeah, it. I love it. Thank you. And then really quick, I just want to thank our listeners. We had so many listeners send us Christmas cards this year. It was the nicest thing. Too opening. nice. Oh my gosh. I want to cry. We had a listener send us a photo of her dressed up as Santa. We had a listener send us a Christmas card with illustrations of all of her cats. We heard from people all over the country and it was just you know, waiting in line in the post office to ship merch is a pain in the ass around Christmas. <laughs> so it was awesome opening up that P.O. box and looking at everybody's Christmas greetings and holiday greetings. It was so nice. Aww. So guys, thank you so much. It was it was great. We love yeah. It. Okay. So we watched season three, episode 14 of Unsolved Mysteries. And what are we covering this episode? I have the first segment, and it's about Debbie Wolf, and it's an unexplained death. And I have a lost love segment that's also sort of an unexplained death of Conradina Olson. And I have a missing segment, and it is about Jeffrey Sullivan. Cool. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so the first segment of season three, episode 14, is an unexplained death segment, and it is the story of Debbie Wolf. Stack says that when 28 year old Debbie Wolf went missing from Fayetteville, North Carolina, her family became understandably concerned. He says that it began as a tragic but uncomplicated missing persons case, but a number of unanswered questions hinted at a darker secret. To Debbie's family and friends, the police investigation appears flawed. Jenny Edwards, Debbie's mother, is interviewed, and she says that Debbie thought that helping people was the best thing in the world. She thought that if she could be a nurse and pay back some of the kindness and some of the consideration that had been given to her in her short lifetime, that maybe she would make her own mark. And Jenny says that she thinks Debbie absolutely did. Stack says, on Wednesday, December 25th, 1985, Debbie celebrated a typical family Christmas at her mother's home. 4 p.m., the day after Christmas, upon completing her shift at the hospital, Debbie Wolf left work, presumably heading home. Jenny says the next morning, Debbie should have been at work, but Debbie didn't go to work or answer her phone. It wasn't like Debbie at all. She never missed work. She'd even call if she was going to be a few minutes late, but neither her work nor her mother had heard from Debbie. On December 27th, the day after Debbie disappeared, Jenny drove to Debbie's home with her husband, John, and a friend, Kevin Gorton. Debbie lived in an isolated cabin seven miles outside of Fayetteville. Because Debbie was usually neat and meticulous, they were surprised by what they found in and around the cabin. Jenny says that Debbie's car was not parked where she usually parked it. She says that they looked around and there were beer cans laying in the yard and it wasn't a brand that Debbie drank. Her dogs had not been fed. They went into Debbie's house and Jenny says there were small things that were out of place. There was a uniform laying on the floor in the kitchen, things, quote, thrown in the kitchen, laying on the floor. And Jenny thinks it looked like maybe she had taken those items of clothing off. Kevin Gorton found Debbie's purse shoved back under her waterbed. There was also an odd message on Debbie's answering machine recorded that day before Jenny arrived. The message was from a man saying that Debbie had missed a lot of days at work and they were worried about her. But Jenny says that Debbie hadn't missed any days at work. And in fact, she had only missed a few hours at the time the message was left. Ridiculous. I I wondered about how she knew that, though. I'll, I'll circle back to it. Okay. But also, um, like, they had just seen each other the day before, so she... Yeah. Yeah, they had just spoken the day before. So she knew she was leaving work, and she knew she wasn't supposed to work until X time the next day. So Debbie yeah. wasn't, you also, know, she, it she is knew that she'd been there. very worry someone, someone who's always prompt doesn't show up. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, anytime someone at my job is like slightly late that's never late I'm like are they okay and like calling them immediately have you ever yeah. had it be something like they were in a car accident or anything like that no no it's never been anything serious but it does make you worry oh yeah 
Stack says 50 feet from the cabin was a pond. The family searched the entire area and found no trace of Debbie. Jenny Edwards called the sheriff's office and was told by law enforcement that they would only become involved after 72 hours of Debbie being missing. That's Horrible. too long. Mm-hmm. I think we've all learned that lesson in the last few decades. On Tuesday, December 31st, the sheriff's department finally conducted a full-scale search five days after Debbie went missing. Jenny says they searched the cabin and brought out bloodhounds who didn't find anything. Then law enforcement walked around the edge of the pond and looked across it. Jenny says, granted, it was a small pond, but that it was deep in some places. So she asked if they were going to search in a boat, and they said that they would let her know the next day. Captain Jack Watts of the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department says they didn't do a dive of the pond because the family had already looked in the pond. I think that's kind of lazy. Unacceptable. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. An untrained family looking in a pond and a professional diver working for law enforcement are two very different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When she was like, oh, I'm going to get my own diver. I was like, you can do that? Yeah, you can. <laughs> like, are they going to know what they're doing? Well, so Jenny then asked Captain Watts if she could hire her own divers to search the pond, and he said, certainly. Yeah, he means they looked before she even hired her own diver. Oh, before the diver. They just, like, trudged they through it. Yeah. No, they looked across it. They went around the land of the pond, and then they looked across the pond. And Jenny was like, are you going to get in a boat? Are you going to go in the pond? And Captain Watt, the, and she was told she didn't know, and then presumably the answer was no. Mm-hmm. So New Year's Day, 1986, Debbie had been missing for six days. Kevin Gorton and another friend, Gordon Childress, returned to the pond. Both men were familiar with rescue work and were experienced divers. Gordon went into the pond, and Kevin says that Gordon was in there for approximately two minutes when he called out that he had found a set of footprints and what looked like drag marks. Mm -hmm. Kevin says Gordon continued to zigzag across the pond, and as he did, he continued to come over these sets of tracks. And Gordon believes that there were two sets of tracks. Stack says two sets of footprints were found along with the drag marks. He then says that the prints remained in the mud for weeks. But I read something later that contradicts that statement. So I don't know where Stack's information came from. And I find that a little difficult to believe. Like, even if it was super still water or like, really thick mud like could it really last that long yeah. yeah I mean I kind of come back to that but two weeks is a long time and it, like I said I never read that anywhere else so I don't know where the two mm. weeks came from so Gordon says that he was about six inches from the bottom of the pond coasting along when he hit something and his mask flooded he had oh, found a body reenactment is so creepy yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty creepy he had found a body halfway inside a burn barrel. Gordon said it was a rusty 55-gallon drum barrel with holes in it. So the police were called to the scene and the dead woman was identified as Debbie Wolf. Mm. Stack says an autopsy revealed no trace of drugs or alcohol in Debbie's system. There were no obvious signs of foul play and the coroner ruled the cause of death as a drowning but was unable to determine exactly when Debbie had died. However, a number of discrepancies soon surfaced, which led Debbie's friends and family to believe that Debbie had not drowned. Kevin Gorton says a typical drowning victim would be found with eyes open, mouth open, hands and arms in a clawed state. Basically, the person would look like they fought for their life. It's so disturbing that he even knows that. <laughs> he says that Debbie looked nothing like that. Her eyes were closed, her mouth was closed, and her body was relaxed. She looked like she was asleep. Captain Watts then says that it was an accidental drowning. He theorizes that she was out around the pond at night. He says she was probably playing with the dogs and fell in. And I am sorry. <laughs> but what is he saying? That she fell in and drowned and then got herself into a burn barrel? So many things. Like, first of all, even if her dogs were water dogs and she was playing with them in the water, she would not be doing that at nighttime. No. She would what not else? fall in and what then suddenly be in the middle of the pond no. inside yeah. of something. Like, yeah. It's it's wild. It's wild. And there were footprints. So clearly and the pond is not that deep for a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. 
So Kevin Gorton also says that he was struck by how clean Debbie was. There wasn't any mm-hmm. silt on her. He claims that when he and Gordon Childress went into the pond, it took them three days to get the silt out of their dive suits. Stack says that the police began to deny that Debbie's body was found partially in a burn barrel. Jenny says that she overheard the police officers discussing how to mark the burn barrel and how to bring it out of the pond, and she thought for sure they would pull the barrel out right then. She says that she then walked out of the cabin 10 minutes later and saw all of the police cars leaving. So Jenny went to a friend and asked what happened and do the police have the barrel? And the friend told her that no, they decided to leave it there and they would get it in the morning. Mm. Jenny says the next day they went back to get the barrel and it seems that the barrel was gone. What is happening? Jenny says all of a sudden it didn't exist. The same barrel that had been there the night before was gone. So Jenny, like, She's just learned that she just learned for sure that her daughter is dead. And now she's like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to solve this crime. They're not doing their job. Yeah. Yeah. And she wouldn't like imagine this whole conversation about the barrel. No. No. It keeps coming up. Essentially, you either believe that her family and friends are just lying. Right. Or that the police made a mistake, made. grievous errors negligence yeah and like why would a family not rather believe that it was an accident yes you know what i mean like who wants to believe that their daughter was murdered so captain watts says in his opinion and the in the opinion of some of the other investigators what the divers believed to be a barrel could have been a field jacket that ballooned out as debbie was laying at an angle in the pond no Watt is trying to say that Gordon Childress, an experienced diver, can't tell the difference between a giant rusted 55-gallon drum barrel and a friggin' jacket. I mean, if he was able to describe that it had holes in it, he saw it well enough to see what the fuck it was. Also, he was was so close to it. This will come up later, but people on the message boards commented, well, it was probably cloudy. It was probably you know, filled with silt and blah, blah, blah. He was close enough that he bumped into her body. I think that's Mm -hmm. close enough to be able to tell what something is. Yes. And then this is unbelievable, but Captain Jack Watts claims that since the barrel was never touched, they can't know that it was a barrel. So I guess that presumes that if you look at fire, but you don't touch it, Mm -hmm. how can you know it was actually fire? You know, like, we have five senses. We don't utilize all five of them all of the time. It's just like such a stupid thing to say. Mm-hmm. So Gordon Childress shoots back and says, no way. There is no doubt in his mind that it was an old burn barrel. He says a 55-gallon drum or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. And like you said, Carlin, Childress even makes a point to describe the barrel as rusty with holes. Yes. Like, he wasn't even you know? like it was a barrel, I think. He was like, yeah. it was a barrel with rusty holes. Yeah. How could that be a ballooned jacket? And why try to even – it's all fishy that it the barrel disappears and then the police chief is saying maybe it wasn't a barrel at all. Exactly. It's like if the barrel disappeared – then just say, yeah, we don't know where it went. But he's trying too hard to mm-hmm. cover up that they lost this piece of evidence or should have brought it out that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, I mean, it isn't like Debbie took her own life, right? That's usually what we see when people are arguing with coroner's reports and unsolved mysteries. Mm-hmm. If it's an unexplained death and the family is like, no, no, it's usually because the coroner finds that this person took their own life. But like you said, Who's going to want to believe that their daughter was murdered over accidentally having drowned? There's no reason for the family to be fighting this unless they have evidence that points to her being murdered. So Stack says that a few months later, Jenny discovered another inconsistency. Jenny says that when she got a chance to examine the clothes that were on Debbie's body, so the clothes that were returned to her, she realized that they were not Debbie's clothes at all. The pants were too long, and although Debbie had owned a field jacket, the one returned to Jenny was a totally different jacket. The new Regulation Army field jacket that was returned to Jenny did not belong to Debbie or anyone associated with her. The jacket had no name tag, and there was no way to trace it to its original owner. The bra that was returned 
was three cup sizes too big for Debbie and the back was two sizes too large for her. So the bra was a 38C and Debbie wore a 34D. Debbie also wore a lady size seven shoe and the shoes returned were a men's size six, which is three sizes longer. Caveat, some people online are like, that's not three sizes larger. That's two sizes larger. I just want to say that doesn't matter. Does anyone <laughs> have is, shoes that they wear regularly that are two sizes too large? Yeah, exactly. Like I'm, the point is the shoes were too big. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter by how many sizes. Yes. And we have everything back at her house to compare to, to know yes. they're not the same size. Yeah. So like whether it's two sizes too big or three sizes too big, the point is, is that they are not her shoes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So Captain Watts says he knows those were Debbie's shoes and he doesn't want to comment on the other clothing. And it's like, that's not really an option, buddy. Yeah. You're on TV trying to act like you didn't totally mess up this investigation. He should probably explain the clothing. It's a big point of contention. He can't just say, I'm not commenting on that. And then have nobody wonder what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. So Stack says that Jenny Edwards had become convinced that Debbie had been murdered, and I am with her 100%. Stack says, along with her nursing duties, Debbie was responsible for coordinating hospital volunteers. One volunteer bothered Debbie about going on a date with him, and he had a history of psychiatric illness. According Why are to we Jen- letting volunteers in a hospital who are... I mean, I have no idea what kind of, so this was a veterans hospital and I don't know if maybe the volunteers were veterans or I don't know. I mean, obviously this person should not have been working in a hospital. This is just back when they let people do whatever they wanted to do. Um, So according to Jenny, the volunteer had obtained Debbie's home phone number and would call her and harass her. And in the reenactment, which we are, you know, have now learned are pretty accurate. He was threatening to come to her house. He was Mm -hmm. saying, I know where you live. I'm coming over. And she was like, do not come to my house. So scary. Yeah. Um, How did he get that information? I mean, he he probably just asked for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hate the 80s. So this man was investigated after Debbie's body was discovered, but apparently he had an alibi and he refused to polygraph. And then he left the state several days after her body was discovered and never came back. The second suspect that Jenny has in mind was also a hospital volunteer. Jenny says there was another volunteer who wanted to become romantically involved with Debbie. And ew, watching these reenactments, it's like poor Debbie. All she wants to do is her job and these gross dudes are all over her. Yep. And I have a feeling that everyone listening to this podcast, female and some male, have had this happen to them professionally. And it's so disgusting. And I hate it. Ugh. And like this was back before you could even do anything about it, you know? The second one is especially gross. His body language. He's yes. leaning his arm on the wall above her yes. head. It is so, so aggressive. He has her like pinned against the wall. Oh, my God. It's so upsetting. So Jenny says that Debbie told people about this man and she told her friends and family that she had told this man that she would be his friend and nothing else. Stack says Debbie was apparently interested in someone else totally away from the hospital. And I read later that she had a boyfriend at the time, but that he was investigated and cleared. I couldn't find his name. So his name is never published. Even that part made me mad that like, she, well, she had told him she had a boyfriend. It doesn't fucking matter if she had a no. boyfriend. If she doesn't want to yeah, date, exactly. she want to date no, you. Exactly. She shouldn't yeah. have to say she doesn't want to date you because she has a boyfriend. She should be able to say, I don't want to date you because you're not interested. a creep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm with you. Jenny is convinced that this second man who kept asking Debbie to be his girlfriend was the man who called Debbie the day after she disappeared, expressing concern about the day she supposedly missed. Yeah. The second suspect was also questioned by the police. Captain Jack Watts says that anyone that the family requested was questioned. He says that the interviews yielded nothing they could use in, quote, any criminal prosecution, and there was nothing to indicate it was a homicide, except for all of the evidence in front of him, I guess. Yeah. The phone call is especially suspect. Yes. Yes. Like, if it turned, like, they would have questioned her bosses and known that it wasn't one of them. So then there's no reason for someone else to be calling and saying you've missed work a lot of days. They're just covering for themselves. Yeah, they're creating an alibi for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Stack asks, what really happened to Debbie Wolf? Jenny believes that Debbie was taken hostage by one of the suspects, kept alive for days, and then finally killed, which is just horrible, terrifying to think about as a mother, as anybody. Jenny and believes think that, her. like, based on the lack of silt and stuff on her, like, that she hadn't yeah. been there very long. Okay. Yeah. Jenny believes that someone returned to the pond later to remove the barrel so that a ruling of foul play would be dismissed. Jenny says there are people out there who know what happened to Debbie and know who is responsible and that she's hoping they will come forward and say something. She says that Debbie was loved by many people and should be able to be put to rest finally. Today, and then today, if they had the resources and if they were doing their job, they would not leave that scene overnight. No. no. And there would no. have been photographs of everything immediately. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wait for it, ladies. Wait for it. I also, it bothered me how in the like reenactment of somebody removing the burn barrel, it was two people. That was like based on nothing. Unless, yeah. but, well, but, but it was the two tracks. Two tracks. Two tracks. Saw the tracks. Oh, I thought like, one of the tracks was supposed to be her. I get it now. Okay. Yeah. No, there were two tracks and then a set and of drag marks. Mark. Okay. Mm -hmm. So unbelievably, because this case is so solvable, the show gives no update. Yeah. Shock. And <laughs> with the sheer ineptitude of Cumberland County Sheriff's Department, it will come as absolutely no surprise that Debbie's murderer has never been brought to justice. Oh, oh my goodness. God. I have to say, I cannot remember the last time I saw a police force so willfully ignorant. Oh. In UM, sometimes we see shady police departments like Boys on the Tracks, mm -hmm. or we have these true mysteries like the death of Norman Ladner. Yes. But this is one of the first times that I've watched a segment and was absolutely shocked by Watts's glibness and misguided confidence when talking about this case, which he has clearly completely bungled mm -hmm. and um, does not give a shit that he and he doesn't give a shit nope <laughs> he cares so, about like, his own pride is what he exactly does. he cares about being right right mm -hmm. ultimately it's ego so it's not surprising that almost all of the internet agrees with with us and thinks that the police were profoundly disinterested in solving this case no no fucks to give and why <sighs> I, I don't know I think, well, we'll get, we'll get to it. So um, in an article I read written in 2019, Jack Watts, who is now 77, retired and living in the Fayetteville, North Carolina, said, quote, nobody's ever 100% certain. Evidence showed, and from the information we had, I feel like it was a drowning. I think we were pretty adamant about what we believed. We investigated everybody. We'd done a pretty good investigation. Oh we couldn't find any marks on the body. It would have been there if it had been foul play. That was consistent with what the medical examiner found. So it really does come back to, I think, that Captain Watts believes that she drowned because he claims there was no physical evidence of injury on her body. I say that's completely ridiculous because, you know, she was in the water. If she was in the water for six days, imagine the decomp. She could have been smothered. There's a million things that could have happened to her that don't leave fractures on the skull. Or, And if she fell and drowned, she presumably would have had to hit her head or something. Yeah. Because I'll get into it, but the water was really shallow. So then she would have some sort of contusion on her head. So the fact that there's no injuries does not preclude her being murdered. Yeah, and I think it, that was that was what like clinched it for him. And that's totally not a reason. Not yeah. a reason. Yeah. yeah, like you're saying, there should be injuries to explain a drowning. Otherwise, she could have stood up mm -hmm. and walked out. Yeah. Yes. Wait until you hear more about the pond. Oh, um so Watts then went on to say that the evidence seemed to indicate that Wolf was playing outside and accidentally fell into the pond. She's not a child. <laughs> I know. Um, he says, quote, it was wintertime and there was a little ice around the edge of the pond. That's the reason she had the big jacket on. Then Watts says there was evidence that Debbie had back problems, which may have made it difficult for her to emerge from the cold water. <laughs> no. I mean, it is, unless law enforcement knows way more about this case than we do, which I highly doubt, this is laughable. All of the reasons that he gives are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely ridiculous. 
So the article also stated that Wolf's body was found in five and a half feet of water, about 30 feet from the bank of the pond. The water at the edge of the pond was about an inch or two oh, deep. Okay. The bottom had a gentle slope and the pond was only knee deep, five feet from the edge. I mean, ridiculous. Well. I also read someone's comment saying that they had been out to the pond at Debbie's place and the water around it was only a couple inches and it would have been impossible for someone to drown and then move to the middle of the pond where mm -hmm. Debbie was found. Inside um, of a barrel. Inside of a barrel. The question that Jenny Edwards continued to ask was how Wolf, who was a good swimmer, ended up 30 feet from the bank. If she did happen to fall into the pond accidentally, Edwards insisted she would have immediately just turned and walked out. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> even if yes. she were even... injured and couldn't get up, she'd be laying above the water. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so strange to me that no one that I could find has questioned Jack Watch as to what he thinks about these drag marks, the two sets of footprints, what explanation he has for Debbie not having any residue on her body. It, it's, it's so strange. It seems like he made a statement in 1986 and then stuck by it without anyone ever, without him ever having to answer any sort of specific pointed questions yes. about it. Anything anyone brought up, he's like, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So... Of course, there's a lot to unpack here. So we can start about we can start with the coroner's ruling. So Roger Rushing was a respiratory therapist at the VA hospital at, where Debbie worked and also a friend of Debbie's. He says he has seen many drowning victims and, quote, she would have shown bloating. There was apparently none and bluish discoloration. However, two autopsy reports declare that the condition of the body was consistent with immersion in the water for six days and nights. This is also very strange to me. The coroner ruled it as an accidental drowning, but the autopsy only found about half a teaspoon of water in Wolf's upper bronchial area. So I was like, okay, how much water do you need to drown? Some studies indicate that a person can drown in one millimeter of fluid for every kilogram they weigh. So a person weighing about 140 pounds could drown after inhaling a, about a quarter cup of water, which isn't a lot, mm -hmm. but it's still way more than half a flipping teaspoon. Yes. Then there's the weird clothing found on Debbie. So I am being really forgiving here. I know that if I went missing and I was discovered, my partner probably wouldn't know much about the clothing I was wearing <laughs> unless it was like a ball gown. <laughs> he would, he would be like, it was a sweater. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, he has a general idea of my size, like yes. almost anybody would. Yeah. So for Debbie to be found be found wearing clothing too big, a bra size three cups too big, and shoes too big would definitely grab somebody's attention. And I saw people commenting, and this is true, that most people wear pajamas or comfy clothes sizes bigger than they are. Like I wear extra large comfy pants, you know. Mm -hmm. But Debbie was wearing street clothes. She had corduroy pants, a jersey a bra, sneakers, and a jacket. So she like wasn't in oversized loungewear. Well, and then, and okay. like, and that was what stood out to me too, is like sizing ranges, things like that range. People choose to yeah. use a different size, whatever, but not for shoes. You don't no. do that for shoes. No. And or yeah. even like a bra. Like I yeah, feel like that would be so well. uncomfortable to have yeah. like this bra sliding all over your body. No. Um, and then there's this jacket, this weird jacket. Mm -hmm. So in 1990, Larry Cheek, columnist, interviewed Jenny Edwards. Edwards told Cheek that her daughter had a field jacket that belonged to one of her brothers, who was six feet tall and weighed 185 pounds. Quote, the jacket found on her body was a men's small. Oh. It was brand new, no markings. And then she had the jacket when he was interviewing her and she gave it to him and she said, look in the pockets, no lint, no sand. If she was in the water mm -hmm. for six days and nights, where's the debris? Mm -hmm. And then also according to Edwards, Debbie was wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers shirt. And Edwards told Cheek, I have never seen it before. Neither did any of her friends. Mm -hmm. Other items found on Debbie included glass beads and a handmade Native American necklace. 
Inside a pouch on the necklace was what Edwards described as, quote, an evil eye. Mm -hmm. It enables the spirit to see its way into the next life. Mm -hmm. I never knew Debbie to have anything like that. Jenny Edwards says, someone else dressed her. And what happened to the uniform that she was wearing that day? Apparently, on the day she disappeared, the uniform that Debbie was wearing was a long-sleeved nurse's uniform for the winter and had both coffee and peas spilled on it from when she had lunch with Roger Rushing, the respiratory therapist, on the last day that she was seen alive. Mm -hmm. So Roger said that he spilled coffee on her uniform, and then shortly after that, she spilled peas on herself, and then they laughed about how klutzy they were. Mm -hmm. As we saw in the UM segment, a uniform was found on the kitchen floor of the cabin where Debbie lived, but Jenny said, quote, it was a lightweight summer uniform that had come from the closet, and the pantyhose were not what she would wear with the uniform that she'd had on that day. Also, the uniform with the coffee and pea stains was never located. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then there is the mysterious disappearing, reappearing, disappearing barrel. On January 2nd, 1986, spokesperson for the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department, Harold Little, is quoted as saying, quote, I am reasonably positive that this will be investigated as a murder. I found a news article with a headline from January 2nd, 1986, that literally read, nurse's body found in barrel. So like I said before, I read comments of people saying that the diver could have been mistaken, that it was muddy and grainy, but like I said, he touched the body. He was close to it. So I don't buy that. Mm. And then, you know, there's all of these, there's basically two different stories. So the day the police showed up, they said they looked across the pond and they didn't see a barrel, but nothing was said about the police looking for the barrel in the pond. Jenny said that they didn't just that they looked across the pond. So the next day, Gordon Childress, who was in the military, he was in the army and an avid scuba diver and had done recovery dives before. He said that he saw the barrel and that he didn't touch anything to preserve the crime scene. Then the sheriff's department was called and the stories diverge even more because remember, according to Jenny, the scuba divers for the sheriff's department saw the barrel, spoke to each other about the barrel and spoke to Jenny about the barrel. And that was also the same day that Jenny noticed the barrel on Debbie's property was missing. Mm, then- funny. As Jenny told us, when they came back the next day, the barrel was gone. In an article from January 5th, 1986, so a couple days after the coroner decided that she had accidentally drowned, the whole official story had changed. So from this article, it says, Sheriff's Major Charles Smith said department divers never saw a barrel when they retrieved the body. After an unsuccessful search for the barrel, deputies said they decided to drain the pond to a depth of two to three feet. Deputies searched the pond, which they called, quote, crystal clear, but found no barrel. So they're claiming that just the day before, <laughs> when Childress was in there, it was so muddy that he couldn't see the difference between a barrel and a jacket. Right. And less than 24 hours later, they're draining the pond saying that it's crystal clear. Yep. You cannot have it both ways. Like, no. this stinks. It stinks like bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um. And then the spokesman, Little, went on to say that the deputy took Childress around the pond and asked him to find the footprints, but that Childress said he couldn't find them. Little said that the bottom of the pond was covered with moss and footprints do not show up. So now there are no footprints and no barrel. It's a totally different scenario. But Childress went on UM later and said that he saw footprints and drag marks. So either Little is lying and misquoting Childress or Childress is lying. Like mm -hmm. who has motivation here, you know? And then also from what I read from people commenting on the message boards, little was incorrect that footprints and drag marks wouldn't show up. People messaging on the board said that in muddy still water, footprints and drag marks will show up and stay in the mud for a really, really long time. So yeah, I've been in lakes where the mud is like sticky, you mm -hmm. know, like that yeah. sticky, sticky, thick mud. I can totally like see that stain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like Clay. wet cement. Clay. Yeah. Yeah. So even if there was no barrel, let's just say that Gordon is a liar or totally mistaken. Mm -hmm. It still doesn't explain the clothing that wasn't hers, mm -hmm. the beer cans that were found outside her property, the house being in disarray, the answering machine message, her driver's seat being pushed all the way back, 
or how an experienced swimmer could fall into a pond only a couple inches deep and then manage to drown and then manage to get her body 30 feet into the water. And the barrel like, being missing from her house. Like her mom, her mom wasn't just like, I think there was a barrel here. And I mean, it had I, an indent where it was too. Yes. Yeah, the imprint was still there. It was recently right there. Um, so I think there was a barrel, obviously. I think the sheriff's department totally messed up the case by not pulling the barrel the day of or having someone watching the house that night to keep an eye on the pond. Mm -hmm. Then when they realized someone took it, it was just easier for them to tell themselves probably too that it was never there to begin with. Like, that's it. You know, it must be so nice. <laughs> it, right. It must be really nice to create your own reality. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of that these days. Uh-huh. <laughs> So I think it's very likely that the person who left the message on Debbie's answering machine murdered her, right? Like that's not a far stretch. In the segment, Jenny says that the second suspect left the message on the machine, but I've since read that it was the first man, the one with the psychiatric problems that left the message. He was the one that le also left the state soon after the body was discovered. The person was setting themselves up with an alibi, but I don't think they expected her family to go up to the cabin so soon. Because if Debbie had been missing for a couple of days and right. nobody could contact her, then someone calling and saying she had missed a couple of days of work would make sense. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking that there could have been a timestamp on the message. Mm -hmm. I tried looking for like when timestamps became the norm on answering machines. I don't know if 86 was too early, but if there was a timestamp on the message, the person leaving the message would have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I bet it was too early because... Even when we had an answering machine growing up, I don't, it was that little tape. Yeah. yeah. And that recorded things. And I think it said the time, but that would have been like, you know, 95. Yeah. Like yeah. We, 10 years we had later. One. We had one when I was in middle school. And it was like the early 90s and that had a timestamp. But like with something like an answering machine, I feel like the quote unquote technology evolved pretty rapidly. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I did fall into, <laughs> I did learn way more about answering machines than oh, I ever wanted course. to. We should start an answering <laughs> machine podcast. Oh, yes. Titillating. <laughs> so, I mean, the popular consensus online and what we obviously believe is that Debbie was murdered. She was yeah. placed in the burn barrel to transport her body, conceal her body, and to keep her body submerged. I believe that the killer didn't think that Debbie's family would be moved to action so quickly and certainly didn't think that they would search the pond as quickly as they did. I also believe that this person was either part of the search or had access mm -hmm. to information about the search, mm -hmm. either through the community, the family, or law enforcement. I believe the killer got really lucky that the sheriff's department left the barrel overnight and the killer was able to get the barrel out that night. The barrel obviously contained evidence and should have never been left overnight without someone watching the pond. So around 2016, Dr. Maurice Godwin began looking into uh, the Debbie Wolf case. And you might know Dr. Godwin from season one of Up and Vanished with Payne Lindsay, the podcast. Mm -hmm. He worked on the Tara Grimstead case, which has since been solved. So Dr. Godwin went up to Debbie's cabin and took some photos and wrote an article about it on his website. Godwin discovered something huge when he reviewed the case files. He said the SBI, the State Bureau of Investigation lab report, stated that there was semen found in Debbie. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Dr. Godwin tried to get the vaginal swab to test it, but was unsuccessful. So for a while, he was all over sitcoms online back in 2002 soliciting for donations so that he could run the DNA from the semen found in Debbie against one of the relatives of the man who harassed her and left the voicemail. Wow. So he was really active for a while and then stopped posting. So I was able to contact Dr. Godwin about the case, and he told me that the state of North Carolina has control over the evidence, so they would have to release it for testing. And obviously, they haven't allowed Godwin access. And wow. since the sheriff's department ruled the case an accident, it's likely they'll never release it. Oh, my God. There were also reports of marks on her fingers indicating that she might have fought back at some point. Right. So it isn't true that there was no injury to her body. Mm -hmm. That's like just a lie. That's a total fallacy. Yeah. 
So, oh my gosh, this case is easily solvable. Fingerprint the beer cans, run DNA. Fingerprint her car, run DNA on the semen. Bring in the suspect again, do more interviews. I think it would probably take less than six months to solve this case with all of the technological advancements that we've had since 1986. Mm -hmm. But is there any evidence? Did they even collect the cans or fingerprint the car? I doubt it because Mm -hmm. when reached for comment for a 2019 article about Wolf's case, Lieutenant Sean Swain, who's a spokesman for the sheriff's office, said because Wolf's death was deemed an accident, the records have been, quote, purged. Hmm. Quote, we do not have anyone now who was working in 86. They have all retired, so we cannot speak on this event. So if even the records were purged, there's probably absolutely nothing left. God, there's nothing to test. So terrible. That poor family. And I know. So this is perhaps the most heartbreaking aspect of this case. There is no one left in Debbie's family to fight for justice for her. Mm-hmm. Her mother and father died in 2002. Debbie's brother, Jerry, died three years before her in 1982. Oh, her second brother, John, died in 2011. And her third brother, Joseph, died in 2015. Mm-hmm. That's and so- that's it. Ugh, horrible. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I don't remember the last time we had a case like this. That where, was where just nobody tried. Yeah. This was not a difficult case to solve. No. It wasn't. If people would have done their jobs properly, it would have been solved. Yes. I mean, there was there was so much there to work with. Yes, you know? including some very real suspects from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like why didn't Unsolved Mysteries put on the show unless they didn't have it? The real recording of that man's voice. So I listened to the real recording of it. Dr. Godwin had posted a link to it. And the reenactment sounds exactly like the recording and is the recording verbatim. Okay. Like so I was going to play. Unsolved Mysteries should have been like, do you yeah. recognize this person's this voice? voice? Yeah. Because I was going to play it for you guys. And then I was like, I don't even have to play it. It it's sounds the exactly one. the same. Wow. I agree with you. I don't know. Maybe the sheriff's department released the recording later. So Mm -hmm. Unsolved Mysteries didn't have it at the time Mm -hmm. um, to use it. I'm not sure. That's similar like with the Dale Kerstetter where they reenacted the video. There must be something. Yeah. Because law enforcement hadn't released the video at that Mm -hmm. point. They didn't release the video for Dale Kerstetter until like a decade later, two decades later. So, you know, law enforcement doesn't release everything at once. So who knows when, when this was released? Yeah. Yeah, it was a rough one. Terrible. Yeah. Good job. Sad. Thanks, girl. Hey, Resolvers. Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. You guys have heard us talk about every plate before, and HelloFresh owns every plate, which allows them to offer a wider array of meal plans to choose from. The three of us love how much time HelloFresh saves us, because as you know, we spend a lot of time researching mysteries for you guys. Using HelloFresh means I don't have to spend any brain power on meal planning, I don't have to wander the grocery store aimlessly like I usually do, and I can get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. I also love that HelloFresh lets me branch out for my usual boring go-tos for dinner. This week, I whipped up their chicken over garlic parmesan spaghetti with Tuscan roasted tomato, and it was so good and so simple. HelloFresh also has tons of healthy and tasty variety. There's something everyone will enjoy, including 20-minute meals, low-calorie meals, vegetarian, kid-approved recipes, and more. I think it's very cool that the packaging HelloFresh uses to ship your food is almost entirely made from recyclable and or already recycled content. HelloFresh is also committed to donating to those in need. So far in 2020, they've donated 3.5 million meals. You can help too with HelloFresh's Beyond the Box program, where you give nutritious meals to those experiencing food insecurity with just a couple clicks in the app. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Mysteries80 and use code Mysteries80 to get $80 off, including free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Mysteries80 and use code Mysteries80 to get $80 off, including free shipping. So this is the second segment in the episode, and it's all about a woman named Conradina Olson. Stack tells us that this is a lost loves with a twist, 
but I don't really see where the twist is. <laughs> and I still <laughs> don't. Except that it takes place a long time ago, but it seems like many of the lost loves do. And a family member is looking for a family member, which a lot of the lost loves do. So, yeah. <laughs> We open with Stack telling us about a lonely, unmarked grave that lies in Ellis, Missouri. Stack says, For as long as anyone can remember, the grave has been maintained by railroad workers adorned with flowers every Memorial Day, which is sweet and nice to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then we see an old timey reenactment of a woman in a great pink get up and hat. And she is 38-year-old Conradina Olson, and she's saying goodbye to her four children and boarding a train in Brookfield, Wisconsin, in 1910. She tells her children that she's going to a doctor's appointment in Milwaukee and will return the next day. She asks the eldest son, Edwin, if he would like to come, but he says he'd rather stay. This would be the last time any of her children would see their mother as she disappears after boarding the train. For the rest of his life, Edwin blamed himself for not going with his mother. Mm -hmm. The main talking head that we see in this segment is Edwin's daughter, Geneva, who's about 67 at the time of this recording. Okay. And her father is dead. Edwin is no longer alive. But in 1983, she begins looking into her family history. And she's, it seems like, grown up with stories about Edwin's life and how he always regretted not going with his mom and always wondered what happened to her. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it took, why she didn't start looking until she was older, but I think maybe she just thought better late than never and it had always kind of stuck with her and she decided to do it. So it's kind of, you can tell, like, clearly a trauma that was passed down to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she learned that in 1891, Conradina, who was her grandmother and was 20 years old, married 30-year-old Carl Olson, who was a railroad coachman. And by all accounts, their marriage was not a happy one. So we see a really terrible reenactment mm -hmm. of a battered woman, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Geneva can't, couldn't find any evidence that Carl was physically abusive, but she learned that he was emotionally and verbally abusive to Conradina. And that's what he, we see. He's just screaming at her and like breaking things right near her. Mm -hmm. um, it really doesn't matter if he was physically abusive or not. It's an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. Geneva says, unfortunately, due to the time period, Conradina couldn't have just gotten a divorce from Carl. And often, if things were bad enough in a marriage, one person would just leave the other. And then I add here, it's pretty rare that the woman would leave the man because in 1910 or the early 1900s or late 1800s, they are not going to be able to just women are not going to be able to just leave and then go make a life of their own and get a job. No. And it's pretty rare that she'd also leave her four children yeah. mm -hmm. with an abusive man. Yeah. So for a long time, that's what Geneva thought happened. She thought that she must have just had enough and run away to escape the abusive marriage. However, uh, Geneva's beliefs changed in September of 1985 when she was working at her gift shop in South Dakota. The shop is called Gifts from Mexico, and it's basically my tchotchke dream. <laughs> the inside shots even show not one, but two white cats figurines like Allison's cat, Alfredo, who yes. OG listeners will maybe remember. Oh my goodness. I was so happy when we I have saw to them. explain. It's yes. a it's a ceramic cat that we have in the pod room. And it's mm -hmm. big. I'd say it's probably a foot long. It's like yeah. Yeah. I would yeah, say a foot not if not two feet. Not, yeah. not little. And we'll post a picture, but you have probably seen this cat. Like I yeah. I want to figure out what they're called. I need to just look that up. We've also seen this same cat in the Queer Eye um, apartment in, I think, the last season, right? Yeah. Or the season yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then there were two in this shop. One is sitting and one is kind of laying down with its head up, which is what Alice Alfredo. Alfredo. Well, is. And there's the one that's sitting that we see in the shop in the reenactment. There is a sitting cat that looks like Alfredo in an eyeglass shop on Hawthorne <gasps> in Portland. How so- do I not have these? <laughs> The family is large. We'll find you one, honey. Um, okay, so we're inside the gifts from Mexico shop, which is also just an interesting, very specific shop to have in the state of South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Um, but one day, Geneva's working there, and a customer named Susanna comes in, and she looks around for a bit and then walks up to the desk and tells her she's a psychic. And then she said, quote, you want to ask me about your grandmother, don't you? And this just stunned Geneva. She couldn't believe that this woman, Susanna, would know anything about her grandmother and how she had been searching for her. Of course, if you think about it in other terms, (laughs) anyone, any psychic could say you want to ask me about your grandmother, don't you? And Someone would be like, what? I have a grandmother. Yes, I do want to ask you about my grandmother. (laughs) So it's a good opener for a psychic to use. Just saying. Yes. Of course, Geneva said yes. And Susanna asked her if she had any of Conradina's possessions there. And she did. And she handed over a picture of Conradina and also her marriage certificate to Carl that she had found. So Susanna, the psychic, flipped them over, and we get a great shot of this woman's fingies and rings, which <laughs> I would say eight out of ten of them are adorned with giant rings. We yes. love it. Um, well, you know, so, she's mystical, so. Oh, you've got to match your mysticism with your jewelry. Mm-hmm. So she flips these two things over, she places her hands on them, and then says that she has a vision of a woman boarding a train children crying, and a fight between a man and a woman near a railroad track. And then, of course, in the reenactment that they're playing as she's describing this, it's Conradina in her same pink attire that we've seen being attacked. Mm -hmm. Um, She also claimed that Conradina's husband, Carl, had known what happened to Conradina. So Geneva's intrigued and she goes to Susanna's office later and she was given more clues about Conradina's disappearance. Susanna tells her that in a few weeks, she will receive several letters in the mail. In them, she would be able to determine the year that Conradina went missing. Susanna also claimed that Ellis had something to do with her disappearance and that she was buried in an unmarked grave. To Geneva's surprise, just a few weeks later, Susanna's first prediction came true. Geneva received several letters and photographs from the late 1800s and early 1900s. It d- never says who they were sent from. Yeah. Geneva didn't know what year her grandmother went missing. Like, she didn't even know what year? I don't know if she was saying you'll get to find out what year she went missing or if she was saying this will confirm like oh. you'll know it's her because it'll have the year she went missing i don't know oh okay she okay. must have known because edwin was older like i forget what year he was born but geneva was born in 1916 so only 6 years after her grandmother went missing. So Edwin was older because he probably had her when he was in his early twenties. Okay. So it seems like he would remember. Yeah. Yeah. That's not that long after. Yeah. Uh, So weird things. Yeah. It doesn't say who said these letters and photographs, but they were all from the late 1800s and early 1900s and were largely sent by Conradina's nieces and nephews And it's just kind of like family letters being traded back and forth. And they talk about how Conradina was unhappy in her marriage and um, then that she had not been heard from since 1910. So this intrigued Geneva further, and she decided to send a letter to a Midwestern newspaper. And the newspaper was so interested in her search that they published the letter. So she wrote... 
In the year 1910, my grandmother boarded the train at Brookfield, Wisconsin to go to the dentist, leaving four small children. She never returned. The children recall going to the station every day when the train came in, but no mother. They searched and searched, but it was futile. They finally left the area and moved to their grandparents in Stanton, Iowa. And that made me happy to hear that they didn't have to live with their father, Carl. Yeah. yeah. Totally. 70 years passed until a granddaughter tried unsuccessfully to find any trace of her grandmother. She went to the site where the disappearance took place, has written hundreds of letters, but has come up with nothing. I don't know if she's writing this in third person or if the newspaper then wrote about her story. Oh, okay. (laughs) A year ago, she came in contact with a psychic. This person told her many things. She said, quote, the lady involved got on the train on her own will, but there was a tragedy. I can hear crying. I can hear her calling to her children. She's being beaten. She's hurt badly. Mm -hmm. She was taken from the train. Geneva is being told that... The name Ellis has to mean something in the abduction. She is buried in an unmarked grave and wants to be found. And then it switches to I. I have all the letters and papers from the psychic. This is a true story. This lost lady has 10 sisters and brothers and none ever heard from her. So then we get another talking head, and this is a little sweetie named Bill Carpenter, Mm -hmm. who read the article and was interested and contacted Geneva. And he told her that there is an unmarked grave near railroad tracks in Ellis, Missouri. Of course, this is the same unmarked grave that Stack opened with at the beginning of the segment. According to local legend, a fashionably dressed woman got off of a train there. She was then seen arguing with a man. Witnesses reported that it appeared to be a lover's quarrel. They were seen walking eastward down the tracks. And later, the man was seen returning to the station alone. He boarded another train and left town. Three days later, the woman's body was discovered along the tracks. She had been murdered, but nothing was found on her to identify her. According to the legend, railroad workers buried her nearby. And they also reenact this, which is just so sad. Like, six railroad workers who work really hard don't think that they're going to have to dig a grave and bury this unknown woman. <laughs> so yeah. sad. Also, the fact that a group of people watched a man and woman physically so, fight, so, yeah. walk down the tracks, and only the man returns and the woman isn't discovered for three days. Mm-hmm. Nobody bothered to like take a walk down the tracks oh, yeah. to see where the woman was. Like, yeah. Jesus. You know, she's probably mm-hmm. fine. We don't want to get in the middle of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's none of our business. Uh huh. Um, so as a result of this story that Bill told her, Geneva became convinced that Susanna the psychic was right and that the woman in Ellis was Conradina. Despite this strong belief, however, a historian who we see, <laughs> oh my gosh, and we love him. He's got a yes. beard to die for. He's you I mean, can't tell if he's 60 or he's 30 with a beard. <laughs> that beard is bushy. Too, it's too bushy. good. Too good. It needs to be conditioned. It, it needs does. to be oiled. It needs some good beard oil and a good beard comb. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't hate it. I don't know. He seems no. like a honey. So <laughs> it he, sounded like you said a hottie. <laughs> he seems like a hottie if you'd shave it. Just kidding. You know I love a beard. I need to find his name because I want to be respectful to him. Oh, yes. I'm looking at him now. His name is Pat Brophy. Don't worry. We'll post a picture of this poor Gina beard. And you can tell Pat Brophy's kind of a shy guy. Like, he just (laughs) wants to learn about history. He didn't ever think he'd have to be interviewed on television. (laughs) He kind of, like, looks away from the camera a lot. He just seems shy, but... He says, basically, I, it's not her. He found in 1888, so way before, newspaper article, which stated that a, the woman who's buried at that unmarked grave in Ellis was actually found on April 21st, 1877. 
Oh, oh gosh. And Connor Dina, of course, disappeared in 1910. Big diff. Big diff. Mm-hmm. Uh, This article from 1888 also says that the woman who was found was described as being less than 20 years old. And by this time, Conradina was 38 when she vanished. So Geneva believes that either her grandfather, Carl, killed Conradina or was in some way involved in her disappearance, which is horrible to think about your own grandfather doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And she learned from relatives that around the time of her disappearance, Carl was also gone for a period of time. So that I mean, would, yeah, not great. Huh. So there's not much out there about this case. It's still unsolved. It's still unclear if Conradina is buried in that unmarked grave. It seems unlikely because of that article. Mm-hmm. Um, someone came up with a name for that woman who is buried there and thinks her name is Lula King, but of course we can't be sure. And I think I found this on Ancestry.com. I found Edwin on there who is, of course, Conradina's son and Geneva's father. And then I found um, his kids and Geneva is listed on there as Neva Luella Olson and she was born October 3rd 1916 like I said so not long after her grandmother went missing and she passed away in January of 2008 Aww. and nothing else has really been found about what happened to Conradina but I think we have an idea and I couldn't find much about Carl Olson. That's also quite a popular name and this was a long time ago. So the name that they gave for the woman in the grave is based on newspaper articles of missing people at the time or something? Yes. One of the articles around that time said that it could be someone named Lula King who had gone missing. Okay. Um, But that has not been confirmed. Huh. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to do with a case like this, you know? Yeah. We don't even know if it's her. There's not much. No. I mean, I guess if you if you really wanted to spend the money and the time, you could have tested DNA against a family member, but it's like, yeah, is it even worth it, you know? Right. I don't know. What was um, the psychic, though? I know. Yeah, that is like, weird because she did know things. She described the whole train scene, which is pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Know. Yeah. It's like we don't know what Geneva told her after the woman initially started the conversation. You know, I don't yeah. I don't know. There's yeah. we don't have enough information to even be able to start a conversation about what like the psychic aspect because we don't know anything that was said. Right. You know? Plenty of people are like, I didn't say anything and she just knew. And then it turns out that they actually gave away a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Or and some really Geneva's family could have known she was yeah. searching for their grandmother. And so she they told this psychic about that. And then the psychic happens to go to the store and look like she never knew anything. Right. Yeah. Or, and like the fact that Geneva had her mother's, her grandmother's marriage license at her store where she worked. Is right. Like, you could tell that she was like champing at the bit to have this psychic work on this case. Yeah. You know, she was yeah. like... A very enthusiastic participant. Exactly. So she's a perfect we, mark for that. Exactly. So we yeah. have to take that with a grain of salt, you know. Totally. But yeah. Well, those I like any kind of old timey stuff. I like looking yeah. at their clothes. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so sad. I mean, it do, it does remind you how trapped, of course, many women are still today in abusive marriages. But I can't imagine. Oh, yeah. Like legally, oh, the then. law is not on your side. You have no rights. Well, and yeah. the whole system is set up for you to be completely dependent on your husband. Yeah, so exactly. you literally don't have anywhere to run to. You yes, just have that. nowhere to go. And you have no birth control. So you keep having children yep. that mm-hmm. you maybe don't want or can't afford or can't take if you did want to escape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awful. Well, and that's what makes me think she wasn't go. She wasn't planning on leaving because she asked her eldest son to come. But why would she? Yes. just take her eldest son with her. Yes, 
that was that's a weird point I, too, especially because it looked like he was like in charge of the kiddos. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? Why would he? Yeah, what? that's what makes me think. I think that, especially when they uh, they, it was a total throwaway that Carl also disappeared around the time. <laughs> yeah, but I think it, you know, it isn't a stretch to think that maybe Carl had something to do with it. He yeah. didn't seem like the best guy. No. And then, yeah, for him to disappear, like, okay, a little fishy. Yeah. Well, good work. Oh, thanks. A lost love without a twist. So this is the case of Jeffrey Sullivan, and it takes place September 23rd in 1963 in Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, 28-year-old former Air Force pilot Jeffrey Sullivan departed on a mysterious covert mission, which is weird because he was formerly in the Air Force. So what was he doing? Um, <laughs> so um, this episode obviously was brought to UM's attention by Jeffrey's daughter, Sherry, um, who is an early 90s dreamboat. Like, she is just... Uh. Honey. She's so pretty. She's, she's very pretty, so and fun. she's just like, you can tell she was very stylish for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this was clearly brought to UM's attention by her. She is like the center of the segment. She's the one that's pushing this and going through all the information. Mm-hmm. So Sherry Sullivan says, the way my mom relates it, my father was supposed to come back in five days. Sherry says that she isn't sure if it's because he was nervous, but he gave her mother his St. Christopher necklace, which he wore all the time. Um, And I meant to look that up. St. Christopher, I believe, is like supposed to protect you in travel. Mm -hmm. Saint of travelers, right? Yeah. Yeah. My husband has one that his grandmother gave him that he always keeps in his car. So Mm -hmm. that's the only reason I knew what it was. Um, Why would he give it then to and not take it with him? Yeah. I think that was significant. Yeah, Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, He had told her that this would be his last trip as he didn't want to be involved in, quote, that type of operation anymore. Hmm. Which, again, he wasn't in the military anymore. So why was he doing that type of operation at all? Yeah. Um, The morning he left for the mission was the last time Mrs. Sullivan ever saw her husband. Stack says that four days later, Mr. Sullivan disappeared over the Caribbean. So Sherry, the daughter again, uh, was only seven years old when her dad left and never returned, and she's been haunted by it ever since. Sad. So Stack updates us to today, and this episode aired in 1991. Um, Sherry is a private investigator living in Maine. And I was cool. Like, oh, Maine. Cool, cool, cool. Mm-hmm. Love her. Then we cut to Sherry in a turquoise tank top. She's got her short cur- curly mullet. She's wearing acid wash jeans. And she's wearing almost the exact same earrings that Conrad E. Olson's granddaughter was wearing in Eliza's segment. Oh, oh really? <laughs> it's those dangly, um, like, turquoise beaded ones. They're, like, almost exactly the same. I was like, that must oh, have wow. been, like, the peak of style at that time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Stack tells us that for the last six years, Sherry has sifted through a labyrinth of bureaucratic red tape and false leads, hoping to uncover the truth of her father's fate. Mm. She tells us that basically um, the family didn't want to believe that he wasn't coming back. So they just didn't talk about it. And she said, quote, none of us were ever allowed to go through a grieving process because as far as we were concerned, he wasn't dead. Wow. wow. Which is so sad. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm not sure. She was probably in her like late twenties, early thirties in that segment. And she's just never been able, allowed to even be like, he's gone. Yeah. Um, Stack tells us a bit of Jeffrey's history. He enlisted in the Air Force at 18, and in 1957, he earned his wings. Then, two years later, he received an honorable discharge and became a freelance commercial pilot. The same year, Fidel Castro's revolution triumphed in Cuba. Quote, the communist threat was now only 90 miles from American shores. Almost overnight, both U.S. government-backed and independent covert operations were launched to undermine Castro's regime. Stack introduces one of the men involved in these operations, 37-year-old Alex Rourke, a journalist and photographer from New York. By writing a series about Cuban exiles, Rourke became active in the campaign to overthrow Castro's government. In 1961, Jeffrey Sullivan and Alex Rourke met. 
Quote, Rourke soon hired Sullivan as his clandestine anti-Castro activities. Stack says, after the Cuban Revolution, a staggering array of anti-Castro operations sprung up in the U.S. Many of them were organized by shadowy characters. Funny choice of words. (laughs) He says it was a murky underworld of these clandestine operations in which Jeffrey Sullivan became caught up. And they're not like official missions or whatever. They're like, no, small sects of people trying to. Yeah. And apparently there was a lot of that. Um, This is kind of like an area of history. I don't know a ton about. So I had to read some of this to understand what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um. In March 1961, the U.S.-backed Cuban exiles prepared to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. On April 17th, they were defeated in less than a day because the U.S. government failed to supply air support, which I did not know was what happened there. Yeah. And that's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, In October 1962, Soviet missile silos were discovered in Cuba, and for seven days, the world was on the brink of nuclear war. Mm. Author William Turner said, which this segment goes through three different men speaking and it doesn't name any of them Mm. except for William Turner later on, but the other two they never name. So I don't know who these guys are. So I'm sorry. Um, Author William Turner says, after the missile crisis, operations against Cuba were still carried on by the U.S. government, but they were trying to be more discreet about it. They did shed some of the more loose cannon operations, and I think Alex Rourke's could have been classified as such. Then an unnamed guy says, there was a public order to men like Alexander Rourke and Jeffrey Sullivan to stop their operations against Cuba altogether. September 23rd, 1963, eight days after the official warning was issued, Jeffrey Sullivan left Waterbury, Connecticut. The next day, he showed up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with Alex Rourke. Sullivan and Rourke met two men in Fort Lauderdale. One of them was Frank Sturgis, who had also been named in the public warning and had become well known for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. Oh, great. Yeah. A third unnamed interview says that Rourke said he did buy a B-25 bomber and that he wanted to take it to Nicaragua. He wanted to talk to General Samosa about having a base of operations in Nicaragua quote, and to ask the general to fit out the B-25 for bombing missions inside of Cuba. So just so we're clear, these are all private citizens who are taking it upon themselves to fight communism in Cuba? So Sullivan is a private citizen. Rourke uh-huh. is a journalist. Okay. And we don't know who this other guy is, the Sturgis guy. Yeah, the Sturgis guy. Okay. Sullivan convinced Rourke to meet with Nicaraguan officials. The four men rented an airplane and agreed to depart for Nicaragua the following morning. The next day, Rourke's wife drove him to Opaloca in in Fort Lauderdale. On the way, they picked up a man Mrs. Rourke didn't know. According to Sherry, quote, he spoke broken English, but she drove them both to the airport where my father was and dropped them off. Hmm. At about 8 a.m., a Travel Air twin-engine plane took off from Fort Lauderdale. It was carrying Jeffrey Sullivan, Alex Work, and The Stranger. Frank Sturgis and his associate were left behind. The next 48 hours are what Stack describes as, quote, a jumbled maze of unanswered questions. Stack tells us that according to the FAA report, Sullivan's flight activities were highly unusual. He had come back to Fort Lauderdale three times with very little explanation. So weird. Very weird. So weird. On his third return, the plane's landing gear remained retracted. So, like, the little wheels didn't come out. Yeah. So the guy at the airport sees this on the plane and is like, hey, your landing gear is still up. You should not come down. Fly to the right. Go around and come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the plane just didn't come down at all. Five hours later... He arrived at North Perry Airport 30 miles away. Author William Turner says that the plane had made a short trip to Hollywood, Florida, a very short distance away where he went in to refuel. The operator at the flight service said that it took hardly any gasoline to refuel it. So a trip that should have been 20 minutes took five hours. And for, for that entire time, nobody knows the plane is unaccounted for. Wow. And it's clearly been refueled 
mm-hmm. recently if it didn't mm-hmm. take that much fuel in Hollywood. Yeah, so this is almost like a fake trip yeah. to go get gas. So the plane with Sullivan and his passengers left North Perry at 1.30. The flight plan listed Tegucigalpa, Honduras as the end destination. Sullivan then contacted the tower at Miami International Airport. At 3.43 p.m., he filed a revised flight plan, this time stating that Tocumen, Panama, as his destination. Howard Davis, a member of the search party, explains that the flight plan Sullivan filed was for a destination that was at least two hours beyond the normal range of his aircraft. He was informed of this by the air traffic controller, and then he changed his destination, but the second destination was also well beyond the range the plane could fly. So weird. And it's like, why didn't he think that people would know that? (laughs) Stack says that seven hours passed again with no accounting for the plane's whereabouts. At 10.22 p.m., Sullivan contacted the Miami Tower again. This time, he said he was heading to Belize. FAA reports show that he refueled in Cozumel, Mexico, just after midnight. This would be the last official sighting of the plane. Sullivan and the others aboard the plane were assumed to have been lost at sea. Despite a massive search, Rourke and Sullivan were gone without a trace. 23 years later, Sherry and her attorney, Carl McHugh, petitioned to the government concerning Jeffrey. Stack says that today they've received over 5,000 pages of documentation from 14 federal agencies, including the FBI and the CIA. Sherry says that shortly after they initiated their Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI, her attorney spoke with an FBI agent on the phone who wanted to question him about whether he really wanted to get involved in, quote, this type of thing and suggesting, quote, maybe it would be better off if we didn't. What? Mm Mm-hmm. She says he had told them they were, quote, opening a can of worms. More than one third of the pages they received from the FBI were censored. So they show this on UM and it's just like black bars crossed most of the lines on the pages. Redacted, Uh, redacted. Yes. According to Sherry, information in these documents indicates that some 400 pages were withheld for national security reasons. Sherry says that that just made her more curious and confirmed that there was something there. Mm -hmm. So then they cut to a a scene of Sherry, like in her turquoise outfit at her kitchen table. And there's like a box in the foreground that just says CIA files. Um, The name Floyd Park was in the FBI documents. So Sherry called Park. Uh, He told her that he had seen her father two days after he reportedly disappeared. Quote, Floyd Park indicated that he had seen my father and Alex and a Spanish fellow in Belize. But Sherry explains that they have not yet been able to verify the identity of Floyd Park. They don't know who he is, what he was involved with in the 60s, or how Jeffrey Sullivan would have known him. Hmm. She says they weren't really able to get those answers from him. And after speaking to Floyd Park that one time, Sherry was never able to find him again. Weird. Weird. The only piece of info Park did tell Sherry was that her father and Rourke may have been taken prisoner in Cuba. Sherry thinks this is a good theory as they'd been involved in clandestine operations in and out of Cuba. She says, quote, Fidel Castro, from what I've, I've heard, had a bounty out on my father and Alex because he knew what they were involved in and he knew they were in and out of his country. Hmm. Journalist Marty Casey was in Cuba two years after Sullivan disappeared. In 1986, Sherry spoke with him. He says that probably some way they did land in Cuba. He says he was with two Cuban exiles from Miami, and they met a fellow they knew from the area. Quote, he was working in the compound. He says he was speaking Spanish, but the guy recognized his American accent and asked him if he knew Rorky. And he said, do you mean O'Rourke? And he said, no, Rorky. He says, oh, you mean the pilot? And he says... No, not him. The other guy was the pilot, Sullivan. He asked how he knew him, and he said he was in jail with him two years ago. Hmm. So um, he's bringing out the point that he corrected him when he thought Rourke was O'Rourke, and the guy knew he that Sullivan was a pilot when he didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. So another name Sherry found in the FBI documents was Enrique Molina Garcia. Garcia was allegedly a double agent with Castro's government. Sherry thinks that Garcia was the third man on the plane and that he tricked her father and Rourke into flying to Cuba. 
unconfirmed reports place Garcia in Havana years after Sullivan disappeared. Sherry says that when she was little, she'd go to her grandmother's house and wind up her dad's watch, quote, and that was my way of keeping him alive, I think. So Mm. sad. She says that she felt like if the watch kept going, he'd keep living. Ugh. Quote, but of course, I'm not little anymore, but the little girl inside me, the little seven-year-old girl that never gave up hope, still thinks he's alive. Gosh. So then they do an update on the segment, and it says, the Veterans Administration is the only government agency to officially recognize Jeffrey Sullivan as missing in action. Sherry Sullivan has not given up hope that she will someday discover her father's fate. Hmm. Which is kind of not an update. <laughs> no. So... As we know, Sherry Sullivan became a licensed private investigator. Um, She also founded a group called Forgotten Families of the Cold War in 1987. So it's like a private investigator group. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. There's so much here. So I'm really going to like briefly kind of take you through the timeline of what's happened since then. Okay. In 2003, a commemorative marker for Jeffrey was unveiled at the Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Augusta, Maine. In 2007, Sherry sued Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Cuba, and the Cuban army, alleging that Castro caused the wrongful death of her pilot father after he was shot down over Cuba and imprisoned in 1963 while on a covert mission. Wow, go big, girl. Yeah. The suit alleged that Jeffrey Francis Sullivan, who was 29 at the time, was shot down and captured and that he died while being held in a Cuban jail for political prisoners. Mm -hmm. Sherry contended that Fidel Castro's, quote, intentionally, unlawfully, and with complete disregard for human life caused Sullivan's imprisonment and death. Wow. So, So in her opinion, and she's a PI, so like she's been doing research. She believed that he was held there and tortured and was there for like 20 years. Oh, my God. Whoa. Oh, yeah. my God. Ugh. So um, at this point, the Social Security Administration had declared Sullivan dead, but the Department of Veterans Affairs had still listed him as missing in action. Okay. So the family needs something to like move on with, I think, is where uh-huh. that comes from. Mm-hmm. Well, they um, get money too if the social security not that that's a bad thing but like exactly like or whatever yeah 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 um quote i don't have any actual proof that my father was executed but i believe he was sullivan told the banger days daily news so a lot of what i have here is from court documents and the banger daily news because she lived in banger maine mm-hmm. and they're the ones that report on this a lot mm-hmm Um, In 2009, Sherry won her suit in a main court. Waldo County Superior Court Justice Jeffrey, I believe it's pronounced him, granted her damages of $21 million plus interest. (laughs) Quote, I'm just overwhelmed, Sullivan said. It was never about money. It was to find out what happened to my father. The answer to finding my father is not what I got. Hmm. And I believe her. I, I really don't think she was in this for money. No, I mean, also, you can't compel the Cuban government to pay this, you know, so it was never about the money because she was never going to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Sullivan filed her suit against Cuba in May of 2007. Um, Also named in the suit were President Raul Castro, former President Fidel Castro and the Cuban army. Uh, Those names were dismissed without prejudice by him because it could not be determined whether they were ever served the documents. The Swiss embassy in Havana served a copy of the suit to the Cuba Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2008. Cuba never responded to the suit, leading Justice Helm to issue his default judgment on August 10th. Hmm. So basically, he ordered a prejudgment annual interest rate of 5.99% be added to the $21 million, along with a post-judgment interest of 6.4% for every year the Cuban government fails to pay the damages. Oh, my God. Um, and other cases like this, people have been paid. So this isn't, like, totally crazy, but... Wow. Um, wow. So Hilm found that Sullivan suffered through years of uncertainty, not really knowing what happened to her father and not knowing whether he was alive or dead. He found that Cuba repeatedly ignored her requests for information. Quote, this uncertainty has devastated Mrs. Sullivan's life, Hilm wrote. Hmm. 
So in his ruling, Justice Helm cited reports of witnesses that seemed to place Sullivan in Cuba. Included was one from the U.S. Department of, quote, rumors from Cuban refugees that Rourke and Sullivan crashed in Cuba and that one died. In addition, an American detained in Cuba in 1969 told authorities he heard Sullivan's name mentioned by Cuban military police. Another American imprisoned in Cuba reported he was detained in a cell next to Sullivan. Hmm. Helm found that despite those documents and many other requests filed by Sullivan over the years, quote, the government of Cuba has failed and refused to provide any information. He also Hmm. found that Maine and federal law provided him with the authority to rule on the suit against a foreign government. Um, Sullivan said... Similar suits filed by victims from the Cuban Revolution under anti-terrorism statutes have proved successful in courts in Florida and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. She said she was unsure when she would collect her reward, but that it had taken others up to three years to collect frozen Cuban assets. If she does receive the money, she said it would be used to help her daughters and grandchildren and to keep searching for the truth of what happened to her father. In the meantime, Sullivan will continue to press the U.S. and Cuban governments for information about her father. So again, she's like, I never asked for money. Mm-hmm. I was in the court asking for information. I want to know the truth. Mm-hmm. So as you said, of course, she did not get that money. No. So in 2012, Sherry sued Cuba again for non-payment of the $21 million. Oh, my gosh. What is this so, costing her to I know, do honey. this too? You know? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is from an article from 2016. And it said, Sherry Sullivan has spent 32 years actively searching for her dad in that time, accumulating about 100,000 pages of often heavily redacted information about him. She has also filed lawsuits against various American government agencies and Cuba, and she won by default a 21 million wrongful death judgment against Cuba in 2009 in Waldo County Superior Court. Hmm. A federal court in 2012 dismissed her claim against the island nation because her lawyer was unable to verify that he had successfully notified Cuba of the judgment despite efforts to serve papers through the Swiss embassy and through Spain, the United Kingdom, Canada, Canada, and other countries with which Cuba has diplomatic relations. Weird. Hmm. So in 2016, like the reason this comes up again is because the relationship between U.S. and Cuba was kind of being patched up a little bit. Yeah. So she was like, why not try again? Mm -hmm. Because she's determined. She appealed again in 2017 and then again in 2018. Wow. So this is from her 2018 appeal, Sherry Sullivan versus the Republic of Cuba. Um, So the document stated, in 2009, a default judgment of $21 against Cuba was won for the alleged extrajudicial killing of Jeffrey Sullivan. In 2016, Sullivan sought to enforce the judgment in federal district court. Cuba failed to appear, so Sullivan moved for a default judgment in federal court as well. This time, the district court denied Sullivan's motion and dismissed her suit for lack of subject matter jurisdiction under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So the the whole thing is really interesting. It's definitely a lot of legal stuff. It's hard to follow if you don't understand that stuff. Mm-hmm. But the main thing the whole thing is centered around was whether or not Jeffrey Sullivan's death could be proved to be extrajudicial killing. But if it wasn't proved to be that, um, she basically didn't have a right to sue in the first place. So the main superior court that she went through the first time said it was an extrajudicial killing, but the federal court argued that that could not be proven. Mm, So at the hearing in 2017, Sullivan presented two witnesses, herself and an attorney. Sullivan primarily testified regarding evidence. Um, The attorney only testified as to Sullivan's incentive for filing suit in federal court. She needed a final judgment issued by a federal district court in order to collect her award from a designated fund established by the Justice Justice for United States Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Act. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. The attorney offered no testimony as to Mr. Sullivan's disappearance that, in her view, proved her father was imprisoned in Cuba in the early 1990s. Okay. So to prove it, Sullivan introduced several exhibits, including a letter from her mother, Cora Sullivan, indicating that Cora had received information about Mr. Sullivan's plane crash and imprisonment in Cuba, 
a compilation of second and third hand reports of sightings of Mr. Sullivan in Cuban prisons, which we heard about before. There were like two or three people that said that. Mm -hmm. Notes from researchers of the show Unsolved Mysteries, which featured Mr. Sullivan's disappearance, Mm -hmm. and a sworn affidavit by Stephen Scherer stating that a security guard at his former job had mentioned encountering a white American who claimed to be a private pilot in a Cuban prison. Mm -hmm. Sullivan Mm -hmm. also submitted additional exhibits after the hearing, including two purported government documents that confirmed Mr. Sullivan's plane had crashed after departing Mexico and indicated that rumors emanating from Cuban refugees suggested Mr. Sullivan may have survived the crash in Cuba. Hmm. So the whole thing is this legal back and forth about all these different acts that play in. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, according to the document, Sullivan failed to provide any evidence, circumstantial or otherwise, that the Cuban government killed her father after keeping him incarcerated for at least 20 years, let alone that Cuba acted extrajudicially. Because Mm -hmm. Sullivan cannot establish that the terrorism exception applies, the district court correctly held that it lacked subject matter jurisdiction. Interesting. Um, So that's where it ended in 2018. But according to fandom, she is still working on this and still wants to get the case back in court. Um, And her other big focus is to get her father's remains, which it's just her whole life. Yes. I know. Since she was seven. She's been like obsessed. And so much emotional energy. Yeah. 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 And I don't want to be negative but i there isn't any way that the cuban government is going to like work with her they're they're not going to they don't have to yeah like, like why would where they? this all goes back to they don't have they don't have to play by our rules they don't have to no, no accountability so yeah yeah and if you think about it from their perspective jeffrey sullivan came to their country to yeah, form a coup or to try to overthrow their leader. So I yeah. I think if you took it from their perspective, they would think that they were well within their right to shoot down his airplane, possibly keep him prisoner, certainly not torture him, but imprison him perhaps until his death. Yeah. So and it was believed I'm sure that the CIA became involved because um Sullivan was like extreme he had extreme allegiance to Kennedy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, like they're Cuba's just not gonna cooperate. They don't have to, you know. I understand her her, you know, profound desire for some to see some sort of justice. Mm-hmm. It just yeah. seems like after 30, 40 years, you might want to temper that with the reality that this prob it's probably not gonna happen. Right. You know? Yeah. Totally. Like would it's her really father really want her yeah spending all of her one life working yeah. on this? No, yeah, it's a lot. and we don't really even really have proof he was in Cuba. Hmm. Yeah, like there's a couple second and third hand accounts saying I knew a guy named Sullivan. How many Sullivans do you think there probably are in the military or in you know involved in hmm. these types of operations or whatever? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the like the plane disappearing and reappearing. Initially, I thought it was going to be discovered that they those men had murdered Sullivan. And had oh, and they and were, were sort of speaking for him, but now it seems like whatever they were doing, they were landing at privately owned airfields. Mm-hmm. And you know, so like, why were they flying around to begin with? I in, don't know. Yeah, and yeah what was the original Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, yeah, what was the original plan? It just doesn't make any sense. It's certainly not very covert. That's for sure. No. It's not sneaky. If anything, you're calling attention to yourself because you're behaving in such a bizarre manner. Yeah, especially yeah, exactly. with stuff like coming in and like being visually seen and then yeah. not landing. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I also I can't imagine being as a private citizen, I guess, with everything happening in our country. I can't imagine actively involving myself in the politics of another country oh, as a private I'm, citizen. No. That's why when I looked all that stuff up about at the time, there were just lots of people doing that kind of thing. I think there was just so much fear, Mm -hmm. just like today, Mm -hmm. some people that they 
felt like there was no other way to be. Like their to. parents were also involved in the Red Scare earlier than. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you think you're on the brink of nuclear war, like, I guess shit gets weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shit gets weird. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't even take nuclear war. No. <laughs> yeah. There's so many unknowns, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, where he landed and what happened to him is an unknown, but all of that other stuff is just as strange, just as weird. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah. That's really sad. It is sad. And it's, yeah. She just, like, will she ever experience closure? Probably not. Probably no. not. Yeah. Have Sharezy Feelzy. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Thanks to share. Thanks to feel. What do we got? What do we got? I don't really have anything new that I've been consuming because I haven't had time to consume anything, unfortunately, except for The Crown, which my husband had not seen any of. So I started at the beginning with him and we're just now getting to the middle of the season that is current um but it's the best if anyone hasn't seen it by now i just love it and it uh the season though is very sad so if you are not wanting to watch a sad show this is definitely the saddest season there's been so far <laughs> we we watched it we um we're on the first second episode now of season four so we went through when it. you get to episode four I can't remember if it's four or five. I have to tell you something that I had a dream about me and you. Me but, you and I? Yeah. <laughs> we found, I can't, I can't tell you because it is a, spoiler this is alert. like the only spoiler that you will not <laughs> probably know about in okay. history. So don't read about it, but, okay. <laughs> um, but then I'll tell you the dream that I had and I, and I Okay. I'll, I'll text you. I'll text okay. you when I'm on episode five. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> You'll know. I can't. I'll look up what episode it is for sure. Okay. But anyway, the crown is the woman playing Diana is just incredible. And Helena Bonham Carter is my true queen. So uh, I love queen. her. A queen. She was so incredible in season three. She was so good. Like at the end of that season, it was really yes. she was fantastic. She's got a, um, they usually try and do like one episode that kind of highlights Princess Margaret. And I just watched that one, maybe six or seven in this newest season. And again, just, she's so good. She's yeah. so good. She's incredible. Um, I watched a thing and I think Allison watched it too. Um, I watched the flight attendant. Ah, so cute. The Kaylee HBO Cuoco. series. Mm hmm Kaylee Cuoco. Uh-huh. And brief, brief synopsis, if you haven't seen a trailer or something, is this woman is a flight attendant. She has a propensity to get drunk and like, you know, wake up being like, what have I done? And she wakes up in Bangkok in bed next to a dead man. Yeah. And I'll just say that much, but it's really fun. Um, I do take issue with the end. <laughs> you take issue with the end? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what part. I can cut it. Just the way they did it. Um, and I know it's based on a book. So maybe in the book that came across better. Ah, uh, but, I haven't watched it, so don't. Tell oh, okay. Me. Yeah. Um, but it was really fun, and it's definitely like obviously a murder mystery from like backwards and with inside. Like, yeah, it's kind it was, of an interesting take on it. So, yeah, I've never seen her in anything before, but she's really likable. Yeah, and I thought she did. I mean, that's the best acting I've only ever seen her in The Big Bang Theory before that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not sure what else she's been in, but you didn't she, yeah. ever watch. Night eighteen rules for dating my teenage daughter. Some some no. shit like that. Oh, no. it had John Ritter in it. Um, oh, is that the one he was in when he died? Yeah. Oh, oh. that's sad. Oh, it was so okay. good, but she played like the hot teenage daughter, and then there yeah. she had a sister who's super cute and less like hot, kind of mm -hmm. boyish. 
she's yeah. been well I, I was really impressed with her acting in this like I didn't yeah. know she could be an actual like that kind of actress so. yeah she I really heard good. her interviewed on armchair expert and that bitch is so rich her husband I mean obviously she makes so much money from big bang theory and then she married into this insanely wealthy family they oh, are wow. really fucking rich yes <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the syndication of that show, that show was on for 10 years and it's on like all the time. All the like, time. It's never not on. I've still never seen one single episode, but I just I haven't either. It's on I've never seen time. it. Oh, I'm glad you watched it. Yeah, I thought it was cute. Mm-hmm. I have to rewatch the ending now because I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I have two. <laughs> the first is Wondery has a new podcast. It's called Death of the Starlet. It's about the murder of Dorothy Stratton, who was a uh, 1980 Playmate of the Year. She had an affair with Peter Bogdanovich and was like probably going to be sort of like the next Marilyn Monroe, like the the mm-hmm. like the next Playboy centerfold to get really famous mm-hmm. and become very successful. And then she was murdered. And I think I only have one or two episodes left, but it's really good. You know, it's wondery, so it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, because the government's being overthrown by crazy people and all this insane stuff is happening. I have an Instagram account that I discovered (laughs) that is pure distraction. It's delightful. I love real estate porn. I love looking at mansions and the tacky ways that rich people decorate their houses and waste their money. And there is an account on Instagram called Zillow Gone Wild. And it's listings. It's basically like listings of houses that are for sale across the country and the, you know, interior photos of them and descriptions where they're located, how much they cost. And it is delightful. Like it is astonishing that money cannot buy you taste. Like you would think it could, but it cannot. (laughs) Once a tacky bitch, always a tacky bitch. (laughs) Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I guess like all of these people are so wealthy. They had interior designers, but I guess an interior designer only works if you, I don't know, listen to them. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Some of these houses are just, and like some of them, you know, you're so rich, you just do whatever the hell you want. So like some of the houses have themes, like Oh, Game of Thrones themes and like spaceship space. So like one house had like a like a David Bowie swimming pool. There was just like a giant swimming pool with a huge painting of Ziggy Stardust at the bottom. <laughs> There's just this crazy stuff where you're like, oh my God, I would do it so much better if I was rich. Like yeah. I would do it so much <laughs> better. Only. Although the pool was pretty cool. I just, I don't believe that anybody loves David Bowie that much. So it's a lot of fun. So definitely check it out. It's an amazing distraction. That sounds really funny. I thought you were going to say the account, please hate these things. No, I don't have that. Oh, I I thought you were the one that turned us on to that. No, I don't have that one. It's like interior design nightmares, basically. Oh, really? Yes. And the account runner is like super funny. So they do funny captions about it. And it's a great follow as well. It's like... How did this ever get past anyone, let alone it had to pass by like three or four people? Because someone then built it to be this way. Someone. Yeah. Fun. All right. So, oh, what are we talking about next episode? Uh, I mm. have the unexplained death, which is also a really sad case and deals with police negligence mm-hmm. of a 13-year-old boy, Russell Evans, in Spokane, Washington. And then I have a wanted segment, and it's about William Bradford Bishop Jr., and it's a pretty big deep dive. Yeah. And then I have my very first treasure. <gasps> Is it? Yes, honey. And it won't oh, be your last. I thought I might get away without having to. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes, it is the story of the Lost Adams diggings. Oh, goodness. Mm-hmm. All right. Go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast if you're interested in supporting us there. If you subscribe at the $5 a month level or higher, you'll get two extra episodes a month and a shout out on our main feed show and some goodies in the mail. We just had a big Patreon shipping. So if you signed up recently, you got some stuff headed your way. To see photos we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram at Resolve Mysteries Podcast and on Facebook and Twitter at Resolve the Pod. 
you can contact us at resolvemysteriespodcast.com, resolvemysteriespodcast at gmail.com, or at our P.O. Box 14005, Portland, Oregon, 97293. Send us your stories for listener short stack episodes. We just recorded one recently, and it was super good. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, email us your favorite Unsolved Mystery story, cold case, any nostalgia you have surrounding the show. Some of you guys have written to us about cases from your hometowns or the areas that you're in. Um, it's all great, and we love hearing from you. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Um, if you like us, leave a five-star review and tell a friend, please, please, please. And for every review we receive, we donate a dollar to an organization. And this month's organization is Big Bones Canine Rescue. Big oh, Bones. Bones. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. We love you so much. Love you. Bye. 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 You know, my shirts on inside out. Don't mind me. It's <laughs> really bothering do me. It now. I mean, not inside out, backwards. Backwards. Oh. I was like, <laughs> the tag, the the tag is like, you doing a little strip tease for it. it. <laughs>Such as the time the Cleveland Indians held their 10-cent beer night promotion in 1974. Because how can making it easy for 20,000 angry sports fans to get more drunk possibly go bad? Well, listen to Behaving Badly, Tales of True Crimes and Other Misdeeds to find out. Coming soon on your favorite podcatcher.